Welcome everyone to the sixth in our series of seven target antibiotic webinars. Last week we discussed prescribing for UTIs. This week we are moving on to assessing suspected infections in children. I'm Professor Claire McNulty, Head of Public Health England Primary Care Unit and PHE Lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. Here with me today are Alistair Hay, Professor of Primary Care Research at Bristol. Alistair has just completed a very large study with Dr. Christy Cabral and his team of children presenting in the community with suspected infections. And also with me is Dr. Sanjay Patel, a consultant in paediatric infectious disease at Southampton and an immunology specialist. So we will now watch the video, which is in three parts, presented by Sanjay, Christy and Alistair. While you're watching the video, think about questions you would like to put to us in the live Q&A that follows. You can do this by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel during or after the video. Sit back and enjoy. My name is Sanjay Patel and I'm a consultant in paediatric infectious diseases at Southampton Children's Hospital. I continue to find it distressing when children are admitted to our paediatric intensive care unit with overwhelming sepsis or other serious bacterial infections. It's an extremely difficult time for the family and all of the healthcare professionals involved. However, I keep reminding myself of one thing, that the absolute risk to any individual child of having an invasive bacterial infection is lower at this moment in time than it's ever been before, simply because of the introduction of novel vaccines to the routine immunisation schedule. The Hib vaccine in 92, Men C in 99, the Prevenile vaccine in 2006, and most recently, the Men B vaccine in 2015. However, I think it is really challenging for both us as healthcare professionals and for parents to acknowledge that the actual chance of an unwell child having a serious bacterial infection is extremely low especially as we're constantly being reminded to think sepsis and we regularly see stories on the front pages of tabloids about doctors failing to pick up a diagnosis of sepsis or meningitis. Obviously GPs, primary care nurses and parents all feel the need to ensure children are safe from potentially life-threatening infections but we mustn't let this concern about these rare cases bias our decision making in terms of antibiotic prescribing leading us to prescribe antibiotics just in case. What we need is robust systems to identify the unwell child and to distinguish the child with a bacterial infection from one with a viral infection. But just as importantly, we need to better understand the factors that drive parents to bring their children to see us in increasing numbers each year, with them often simply seeking reassurance from someone they trust. During this webinar, we're hoping to get the following messages across. In general, Parents don't actually expect antibiotics when they bring their child to see a doctor. Most just want someone to listen to them, to examine their child and tell them that they're okay. Parents often mirror our behaviour. If we practice defensive medicine and prescribe antibiotics just in case, we're educating the parent to expect antibiotics the next time their child has similar symptoms. We know that one source of uncertainty for frontline primary care clinicians treating children with respiratory tract infections and cough is knowing which children might go on to need hospital care for their infection. And this uncertainty can drive use of antibiotics. Using a shared decision-making approach where healthcare professionals and parents go through resources together can have a huge impact on antibiotic prescribing in future reconsultations. The impact of GPs using the When Should I Worry resources developed in Cardiff and published in the BMJ a few years ago showed a 50% reduction in antibiotic prescribing in children and a 70% reduction in future reconsultations. Clearly, investing time up front may save you a huge amount of time in the long run and avoid lots of unnecessary anxiety for parents especially as children under five years of age present acutely to GPs on average four times a year. Providing parents with clear safety netting materials and information about home care 
such as on the Caring for Children with Cough website and the Healthier Together website, which I've developed in Hampshire, is an excellent way of empowering them, not only during the child's current illness, but also during future illnesses. Giving parents clear, nice guideline-based safety netting information can help keep children safe. Deep down, we know that it's not easy to distinguish whether a child has a viral or bacterial infection. However, exposing children to unnecessary antibiotics will simply result in side effects and will drive antibiotic resistance. I suggest looking for resources on common infections available to you and signposting parents to them during the consultation. Identifying some clear safety netting advice resources and if you're really not sure if an infection is viral or bacterial, consider putting in place a follow-up to reassess the child or using a delayed prescribing strategy. Thanks for watching and enjoy the webinar. Jane has brought Johnny, her 18-month-old son, to see Dr Singh. It's been going on about three weeks now. Started out like a normal cold, but it's not getting better. He can't sleep because of the cough and he's hardly eating. I just wanted to get him checked out. Dr Singh thinks this is probably a bad cold, but wants to make sure she's not missing anything. She needs to decide whether this child will get better or end up in hospital. She is conscious that she has many patients to see this morning and has only 10 minutes to make the right decision. She also thinks the mum might be expecting antibiotics and will feel more satisfied with the consultation if she gets them. Jane wants to make sure her son doesn't have a serious infection, but she also has all sorts of other worries that she is hoping Dr Singh will help her with. How to look after him. That he isn't eating that he isn't sleeping properly, what to do if he gets a very high temperature, if it's okay to keep giving him the child paracetamol she has at home. <coughs> Dr Singh does not know about Jane's worries. She is focused on checking for any sign of a more severe infection. Mum told me that he had a temperature, but he doesn't have one now. Oxygen is normal, tonsils are looking okay, but is that a slight crackle from his lungs? Dr Singh is worried. Children can go downhill fast and it's sometimes hard to be sure how sick they are. If this was just the first week that I've been seeing him, I would say, let's just watch and wait. The fact that it's been going on now three weeks, he had a slight temperature, I can hear a slight crackle on his chest. I think it's probably worth starting a course of antibiotics. OK, I'd expect him to start picking up over the next few days. Will the antibiotics take a couple of days to start kicking in? Yeah. If he doesn't start to pick up, give us a shout and we'll have another look. Jane didn't really expect antibiotics this time, but she trusts the doctor's opinion that they are needed and will give them to her son. She also thinks that next time he has a similar cough that lasts more than two weeks, she must come back for treatment. Dr Singh thinks Jane is satisfied because she has been given antibiotics for her son but most of Jane's worries have not been addressed. Jane is still worried about her son's symptoms and how to manage them. Our research has shown these are common worries that parents have. He's not sleeping. How is he going to get better if he's not sleeping? He's not eating properly. What if it affects his development? How will I know if he's getting worse? What should I be looking out for? What should I do if he gets feverish and shivery again? Should I strip him off or not? Is it OK to keep giving my child paracetamol? Will the antibiotics make him sleep and eat normally in a few days? If not, maybe I'd better bring him back. Parents will often leave the doctor's surgery with many of their worries unanswered and sometimes with antibiotics they were not expecting. Our research has shown that what parents really want is reassurance and advice. They want to know how to treat symptoms, how to manage the impact on their family, and what to look out for to make sure their child does not become seriously ill.
briefly summarise uh, some of the other systematic review evidence that we um, conducted. Uh, so this, these are studies um, uh, where we've um, reviewed the worldwide literature for evidence. And in particular, we were looking for evidence that uh, has been shown to reduce antibiotic prescribing. And there are four key themes that emerged. The, the first is that it needs to involve both parties in the consultation, ideally. Um, so clinicians and parents are um, most likely, if they're involved in these interventions, uh, they're much more likely to be successful. The second is that, and I've used Maureen Baker's photograph here, she's the chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners, the second is that if clinicians are involved in the design of these interventions, they are much more likely to be effective. The third is that if you can incorporate the interventions into the flow of clinical care, for example, using electronic medical records and the, um, uh, the resource that that is in terms of pop-up reminders and so on, then again, uh, interventions are more likely to be successful. So finally, delayed prescribing is also effective in reducing uh, prescriptions. So the ideal uh, intervention is going to incorporate these four um, characteristics. Um, another element of the work that we did, which has already been published in the BMJ, was looking at post-consultation symptom duration. And again, we've reviewed the world's literature for all the evidence on this problem. And uh, we know that if you can manage expectations appropriately in the consultation, you're more likely to end up with a parent who doesn't look like this and maybe one who looks a little bit more like this. Because um, just simple information can really help um, bring parental expectations into line with what's most likely to happen. Um, so we've found that uh, croup symptoms are most likely to last for around three days, sore throat seven, earache eight, common cold symptoms 14, and cough 21. And most of that actually is not particularly new. The, the two elements that are relatively new are the earache and the cold symptoms. And I just want to highlight that our sense was that there's not a great deal of point in telling parents the point at which 50% of children have resolved, because for their particular situation, they've got a 50-50 chance of either being one of those parents or not. And that's not great if for the half whose symptoms go on for longer and therefore are questioning, do I need to come back? So our sense was it was probably more useful to tell parents the duration by which 80 or 90% of children's symptoms will have resolved. And for earache, as, as you can see on the arrow there, that's a little bit longer than NICE, for example, currently says. NICE says that earaches last four days. So the evidence looks like it's probably uh, ready for a little bit of an update. And that's true also for common cold symptoms, that they are a little bit longer than current NICE and CDC in the States uh, would currently recommend. So the purpose of that final element of the programme was to see if we could use children's baseline characteristics, so the symptoms that parents report to us, the clinical examination findings, to predict which children would end up in hospital with their respiratory tract infection. So a group who've got really quite poor prognosis. And, con uh, and the, the opposite, of course, being that are those same symptoms and signs um, useful for identifying children who are not going to end up in hospital, uh, who've got a good prognosis, and maybe in whom we can feel a little bit more confident to withhold antibiotics. Now, with the help of uh, literally dozens, in fact, I think it was 250 or so GP practices, we recruited just over 8 and 8,300 children to this study. Uh, admission to hospital with a respiratory infection is a relatively unusual event. Um, so we knew we needed a large number to have some statistical confidence in our data. And uh, we collected all the same symptoms and things that you'd expect and that Jeremy showed us earlier on. These are all the, 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 the things that parents tell us and that we examine. And then our statisticians, and forgive me for those of us who are academics in the room because we're not going to go into the detail, um, our statistical team uh, made some sense of all of that data. 
and identify that there are in fact seven characteristics that can be used to identify good and poor prognosis children. And we've called this a mnemonic, which we've decided to call Star Wave. And each of these seven features are risk factors for children being admitted to hospital with a respiratory infection. And these uh, admissions were not occurring on the day that the child was uh, recruited. So these are not diagnostic, these are prognostic. These are characteristics that tell the future. So only 20%, 19% of the children were actually admitted on the day that they were seen. So 80% were admitted on the subsequent days. So I'll just run through them. They're pretty self-evident, but children with a shorter illness duration were more likely to end up being admitted. Uh, children whose parents reported that they'd had a severe fever in the previous 24 hours, or where the clinician recorded that there was a fever at the examination. Children who were under the age of two. Um, clinicians who reported that they could see the child was struggling to breathe. This is where the, the, the muscles between the ribs are being drawn in on, on breathing which is actually probably a sign that parents can recognise as well. Uh, clinicians who reported wheeze on examination, children who had a current diagnosis of asthma, and children whose parents reported that they had vomited moderate or severely in the previous 24 hours. So again, some more statistical work, and one can take these seven symptoms and signs and group them such that you can start to stratify the risk of subsequent hospitalisation. So the very top row there shows you the risk of hospitalisation amongst all children in the entire 8,394 cohort. And you'll see that it's just under 1%, so around 1 in 106 children uh, in totality. For children who had none or one of those seven features, their risk of being hospitalised falls quite considerably to around 1 in 300 or thereabouts. We then have a, a sort of middle group. Uh, those are children who have got two or three of these features uh, and their risk remains more or less the same, of a similar order to the whole cohort. And then there are children who have got four or more and their risk of hospitalisation increases quite substantially. Um, very approximately around 60% of children fall into the first category, that, that low risk category, uh, around 30% fall into the two to three and the remaining fall into the four or more. In summary then, we've said that interventions that are most effective at reducing antibiotic prescribing involve both patients and clinicians, occur within the consultation, can use automatic prompts and uh, use delayed prescribing. We've talked about the value of setting realistic expectations in terms of post-consultation symptom duration and we're thinking about the role that Starwave could play in the care of children in primary care in the future. Welcome back. I hope the video has raised lots of questions for Alistair and Sanjay about understanding parents' expectations and how to manage a consultation when you're assessing the severity of a child's illness. Again, like last week, if you want this Q&A in full screen, click on the icon in the bottom right hand corner. Please do keep those contentious questions coming. So first of all, um, Sanjay, I've got a question from John. Um, you mentioned and he mentions about bacteria and viruses and I was thinking a similar sort of thing because there's one of the papers that we um, have got on the website is a qualitative paper um, by the Bristol group again, showing that parents did not find um, when clinicians discussed the differences between bacteria and viruses, they didn't find that very helpful. So how should we be approaching this in the consultation and should we be using those terms? Do you know, an excellent question and I think um, to me it really highlights the difference between how we think as clinicians and how parents think. And it also highlights the danger of us, us assuming we know what parents are thinking and expecting. So I speak about bacteria and viruses a lot because when I assess a child with a, with a fever, with an infection, I'm trying to clarify in my mind whether I think there's a high risk of it being bacterial or not and whether they require antibiotics. But as soon as one uses the terminology virus to a parent, 
there is it can potentially be perceived as, as us thinking especially when we use the terminology self-limiting illness that we think it probably shouldn't have been brought to us in the first place and, and what we're really trying to do is address parents expectations which often are I'm worried about my child they're unwell and I think it's more effective if we talk about severity of illness and I know the work Alistair did the qualitative study really suggests that that when we speak to parents and try and reassure them we should speak about severity of illness not viruses and bacteria. Okay so um, Alistair may I ask you about the interviews you did with parents so there's a question from Toby did you study um, all sorts of different parents or were they just parents from nice areas in Bristol that you managed to recruit? So again, um, good question because if we had just studied parents from nice leafy suburbs of uh, our various counties, uh, that's not going to be very helpful to all the other uh, primary care clinicians, GPs and nurses and their patients who are in different parts of the, the country. So so yes, just to reassure you, um, the study included parents from all backgrounds, the, the more wealthy, the less well-off, different ethnic backgrounds and, and different ages of parent as well, so more experienced mothers and, and less experienced teenage mothers, for example, as well. So Abigail, um, not Abigail, Gillian is asking, were there any parents who were more likely to expect antibiotic treatment in those groups? So um, the, the broad answer is that the expectations of parents were very similar and, and it didn't vary depending on how wealthy they were or which sort of background they came from. So, so most of the results, in fact, can be applied to pretty much all parent groups. The one thing that did seem to make quite a big difference was whether the parent had received an antibiotic for their child's illness in the past. Mm -hmm. And that really set the tone for those parents. They were far more likely to expect treatment again in the future. And I suppose that just illustrates, particularly for those very young parents who are bringing their children to us for the first or second time, that if we get the trajectory, well, however we set the trajectory at that point is going to influence their future consulting. If we prescribe an antibiotic, we might be creating a rod for our own backs. Uh, of course, the, the decision to prescribe has to be based on the individual circumstances, but just bearing in mind that if a prescription is the outcome, that's going to set the expectations for the future. So that takes me on for one for you, Sanjay. So it's about anxiety. You probably see a lot of anxious parents as well. But actually, uh, Reese asked this question. Do anxious doctors magnify parents' anxiety? Another good question. And it's how we define the word anxiety to some extent. Yes. I think if we, if, we, uh, if we call doctors who have a low threshold to prescribe anti antibiotics as, as anxious doctors, and I think that is probably a reasonable way of approaching it, then, as Alistair has just said, it, it does impact on... Um, parental expectations the next child is next time their child is sick if you've if you have if your health seeking behavior has been reaffirmed when you go to a doctor um, that can be any doctor not just a gp but an out of hours gp it can be going pitching up to ed and uh, and we do this in hospitals so often we we say to parents oh well done you brought your child in you know you must have been really worried and we're reaffirming some of their health seeking behavior and, and we know it has a knock-on effect on expectations for antibiotic prescribing in the future. Okay, so since we've been talking about hospitalisation, a visiting hospital, so we'll go back to the star wave because we've had a few questions about the star wave which are coming in in particular. So um, why did you choose to use hospitalisation as a marker, as the outcome for in respiratory tract infection, Alistair? Okay, so the team chose hospitalisation because um, that was the thing that clinicians told us was driving some of their prescribing. So um, one of the studies that the, that the team did that Jeremy Horwood led, uh, we talked to, to clinicians and they said that some of the prescribing is done just in case. It's where there is some residual uncertainty. I'm not entirely sure whether this child has, is going to sort of track on a good trajectory if they're going to have a good prognosis illness where they're going to essentially just resolve quickly and well or am I in fact looking at a child who might subsequently deteriorate with the mm. worst case sort of scenario being that they end up in hospital and I think clinicians are naturally concerned that they don't want to withhold an antibiotic from a child who even though pre-star wave 
they didn't know wasn't going to end up in hospital, but if they've withheld an antibiotic from a child who subsequently ends up in hospital, that doesn't look good. At best, it's embarrassing, and at worst, it could have medical legal consequences. So, um, Sanjay, do you think the star wave could be used in the out-of-hours setting as well as in the GP setting? Because there's a lot of antibiotic prescribing going on in out-of-hours. No, there is, and I think the out-of-hours setting is different. We know it's different because the, um, the continuity that one gets in primary care is not necessarily ref reflected in out-of-hours GP um, presentations. And there's also the other question, the children who go to out-of-hours GPs more unwell than those that present to their own, um, their own GP. And I think, I think a lot of star wave could be applicable to out-of-hours, but I think it requires a separate evaluation. Okay. Okay, so unless they're you know, very similar. What do you want to add to that, Alistair, in any way? Um, no, I would agree. I think that if you feel that the setting in which you're working is sort of broadly reflecting normal in-hours GP care, um, then it may be possible with certain caveats, which I can come back to, to use Starwave. But if you feel that you're in a setting where you're seeing children with a different spectrum of illness, perhaps more severe, or particularly a, a population who, are, who have already been seen by a GP and they've been referred in, so this is a sort of second tier group of children, then I don't think the science would hold up to say that star right. wave can definitely be used there. So this is a watch and wait. We need to assess it in out of hours um, in a bigger study. Uh, and I think, if I may, Claire, it's worth just adding that this star wave we think is a really exciting development. Um, and uh, it's got very good prognostic properties. Um, but we just need to bear in mind that no tool or diagnostic aid is perfect. Um, and so we think that um, it needs to, to support and not replace clinical judgment. And we're currently applying for funding to do research to see whether it will actually reduce antibiotic prescribing. Yeah, so you've answered one of the questions from somebody who's come in as to what happens if the score is at odds with the clinical judgment? Uh, go with your clinical judgment. Okay. Definitely. Do you know, okay. I, I, have, I want to ask you a question, Alistair. I mean, I would be really excited to see Starwave evaluated in a front of, front of house hospital setting, such as ED, because I think we're all recognising a number, of, an increase in the number of what we would call historically primary care presentations to ED. And I think there is a discrepancy in management, often by very junior ED doctors, as opposed to very senior experienced GPs. And I think that consistency of messages mm. and management is so important. Yeah. And until we can align what's going on across the urgent care pathway, that is, routine in hours primary care, out of hours primary care, pharmacies, practice nurses, often community paediatric nurses are doing more and more, and ED, until we can bring a consistency to that, we're going to be giving very mixed messages to parents, and that will have an impact on their expectations. Yeah. So can I ask you something else, Alistair, about, so you're talking about mild and severe illness, so the qualitative work showed that the parents said that the mild, they were happy not the parents, the clinicians said that they were happy to distinguish the mild illness and the severe illness, but it was that intermediate risk that was difficult. So how is this actually star wave going to really help distinguish okay. that intermediate group? So I suppose the way to think about it is that you've got your here and now. So you've got the child in front of you. We're all familiar with this sort of situation. And what the evidence tells us is that we're, we're comfortable as clinicians identifying the group of children who are very well. These are the ones who are sort of tearing around the waiting room, pulling out all the toys of the toy box and so on. And we're comfortable, we're not happy, but we're comfortable identifying the uh, poorly children, the really unwell children, because those are the children that we know need, usually need hospital care. It's the group in the middle that are the ones that still cause us some concern. It's where they're, you know, they're quite unwell. They're not, they, we know they don't need hospital care right now. And we know they're not running around the, the, the waiting room happy as Larry. Um, and it's that group that the Star Wave could be useful in. Because what Star Wave does is it doesn't assess the here and now. It predicts the future. It gives us some sense of, is the child in this intermediate group the sort of child that could, in the next 30 days go on to need hospitalisation. Or conversely, and we think this is the most useful thing about Starwave, is this a child in a low risk group? And we know that there's the seven characteristics of Starwave, they're on the, the website. Um, I think there's a summary sheet, uh, there is a summary sheet that looks just like this. So we know the seven characteristics of Starwave and if they have one or less of these, 
we know their future risk of hospitalisation is really low. It's less than one in 300. So we think that that will be the most useful thing for clinicians is to perhaps increase confidence, reduce clinical uncertainty, uh, that maybe that's a group of children that don't need antibiotic treatment. So we've got a question from Rachel, two questions. The first one is, it sounds, Starwave sounds very interesting, just as you just said about predicting admission. What about, can it be used to determine whether you need antibiotics or not? And how would you use it? It says something a little bit about on the sheet yeah. as well. So, I mean, this, is, this does need to still be formally evaluated. So what we're doing is we're saying this is how we think it could be used and this is how we think it could possibly add to your current clinical care. Yeah. So if you've, if you've got a low-risk child, so a, none or no more than one of these Starway features, that's about three-quarters of children. That's a group in whom they have a very low risk of subsequent hospitalisation, so less than one in 300. Now at the moment, our data show that about a third of those children are being prescribed an antibiotic. Now if some of those antibiotics are being prescribed just in case, then it's possible that we may have more confidence that that just in case prescribing isn't needed in that very low risk group. I think that's the main value for the Starwave tool. Okay. I mean, there are other risk groups which um, I think folk might want to look at. And for example, if you're in a high risk group, that's where you've got four or more characteristics, then that suggests to, to us and my team that we should be keeping a very close eye on those children. These children have about a one in uh, nine risk of being admitted in the next 30 days. So uh, a child to watch carefully, consider an antibiotic, but perhaps more importantly, really watch them carefully. And what about delayed antibiotics? Well, actually, I, before, I, yeah, I'll answer yeah. delayed antibiotics in a moment. But I think w when I read this, your Startwave paper and I looked at your study, what I found most interesting was that, that that absolute risk of any of these children, but especially those in that moderate group, and it's that intermediate group that we as clinicians find most challenging, is extremely low. And I think this reflects my own, my own observations with invasive bacterial infections and the things that parents are really worried about and the things that we're really worried about especially are missing in children is sepsis and meningitis and we're hearing the sepsis you know don't forget sepsis we're hearing sepsis messages the whole time and I think that we have to have an understanding of the absolute risk of all of these adverse outcomes and although our, cogn our cognitive bias is based on what we see in the media we have to remember that those rates are lower now than ever before because of all the vaccines that have been introduced to the routine childhood schedule in the past 15 years. And so this is another <coughs> bit of really useful information to add to clinicians' absolute risk calculation that we put in our heads, a pre-test probability and a post-test probability. I think it's really important. I think it's a great study. So actually that takes us on to really the NICE guidance and sepsis. How does this, the Starwave resources, complement the NICE traffic light, traffic light system to identify serious illness in the feverish child? I think they're different. I think they're different tools, actually. I think um, when there's no good focus of infections, when you've got a, an extremely unwell child, that's what the sepsis, the nice sepsis tool is trying to identify. I think there are challenges with it. They've been introduced recently and they need to be evaluated in primary care. A lot of work around the country is going on in terms of evaluation, but I think they're slightly separate tools. This is really focusing on a pathology. Starwave is focusing on a pathology that's our primary, our biggest pathology driving antibiotic use. Sepsis is not. Sepsis is a small number of children with extremely adverse outcomes. So they're different. Do, do you agree with that, yeah, Alison? I, I do. Um, and but everybody's been saying we've got to identify that child with sepsis. We do. So we, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so how, does, so, how do they complement each other? So, uh, I mean, you know, it's a complex question. I'm not pretending that I'm going to answer the whole, the entirety of it in one sentence. But, but you know, there is this real tension between identifying the really sick child who needs immediate antibiotic treatment and needs urgent hospital support. Uh, and fortunately those, as Sanjay is saying, and reminding us, those children are few and far between. Mm. And what the NICE traffic light tool does is it's one of the tools that can help us identify those children. Okay. What Starwave does is it does, it's complementary, it does something slightly different. It's, I've already decided this is not one of those very seriously unwell children but I've still got some residual uncertainty and some of that uncertainty is 
not about the here and now, it's about what's going to happen to this child over the next few days and weeks. And Starwave can start to help us make some, some judgments about which of the children we're going to end up with poor prognosis in hospital and who are the children, fortunately the vast majority, who won't need hospital care and, and won't go on to have a, a severe trajectory but will have a normal improving trajectory. So and it comes yeah. down to access and excess to some extent, which is where stewardship, you know, what we're not trying to say is that we should not be prescribing antibiotics to children. And, and it's really good that you have brought up the nice sepsis guidelines because there are clearly children that need antibiotics. And that's why access should not be diminished by all of these discussions. But there is an excessive use of antibiotics. And that's where tools like Starwave, etc., are so valuable because we know that we can markedly reduce antibiotic prescribing but we have to be mindful of the drivers for current prescribing and provide those tools to address them. So one of the drivers is length of illness so and you saw it in the animation so the length of illness was a predictive factor but um, does this mean that parents who come in with a, with a child after two to three weeks are less likely or you know because we actually tend to more we're more likely to give them antibiotics so what should we be doing with those children because your star wave well, maybe suggests we're doing the wrong thing well I mean it's it's again this is not to replace clinical judgment but what star wave tells us is that if if parents have brought their children in early in the first three days then that is just one of the seven risk factors that makes them more likely to be in that group of children who are going to be hospitalized if children have been brought to our attention after that, then that is protective. It's less, they are less likely to end up in hospital, needing hospital care. Okay. I think uh, we have to recognise that a lot of parents bring their children back for reconsultations. And we find that challenging as clinicians because you think, God, if they've brought them back a second time, they're still worried, what should we be doing? And I think we sometimes build up those expectations we're trying to be extremely helpful by saying your child's going to be better in a few days. Sometimes we use the word virus, etc., etc. And children aren't usually better after a few days. We know with most of us in the past few weeks, there's been things going around. We've been coughing for two, three weeks. And, 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 and a tool that I mentioned in the introduction, introductory video is this um, When Should I Worry tool, which was developed by uh, the research team in Cardiff. And they've got some fabulous animations, and these are, I say, animations, some fa fabulous pictures, which are these smiley faces that give parents a really clear idea of how long symptoms last. And this is for coughs and colds, and it shows that after a week, 70% of children are still coughing. After two weeks, 30% are still coughing. And actually, by about three weeks, there are only about 20% of coughing. And I think that we have to be very clear about the natural history of these self-limiting conditions, because otherwise parents are just going to come back and then it is harder not to prescribe. If we've kind of, at that point, retreating by saying, well, actually, I know I said it was going to get better after a couple, a few days, but it's not, but that's still normal. So where is this, when would, the, would um, GPs use this in the consultation or nurses use this booklet? How is, it, how is it best used and how has it been evaluated? Yeah, g great question. I mean, this was developed uh, about 10 years ago now. It was developed, as I said, in Cardiff. Um, it's really focusing on its target group as children above six months of age, between six months and 14 years of age, with respiratory conditions predominantly. So that's upper and lower respiratory tract infections. And the approach they took was that they'd looked at a lot of purely educational resources where parents are just given resources up front. Um, and they didn't necessarily have a huge impact on prescribing. And their approach was a shared decision-making approach. And we use that term a lot now. And this, these are in the days before that terminology was used quite as much. And by having a resource that parents and clinicians can go through together, they found that antibiotic prescribing reduced by 50%. Which is, which is huge because there are very few other interventions, including delayed prescribing, that has reduced prescribing so much. And their evaluation was a, a, a randomised, uh, was a cluster randomised controlled trial. So they identified about 60 GP practices and 30 of them used the intervention and 30 of them didn't. And the 30 that used them received some really good training on it. And that training's available online. So if you were to type in, when should I worry into Google or look on the target website, you'll be able to find the res these resources. And the two messages from the training were, attune yourself to parents' expectations. Don't think you know what they want because 
what some of Alastair's work and the work of a number of, pe of people has been is that clinicians think that parents are expecting antibiotics when they bring their child to see us. Well, they're not often. They actually just want someone to look at their child and say, your child's okay. And the other thing was, by using these resources, you can bring some credibility to what you're saying and give them an idea of how long symptoms yeah. are going to last. I mean, and, and the other bit of the evaluation was that for parents to, that went through it were clinicians, parents that use these resources, their chance of future reconsultations was likely to be less, considerably less. So what is the difference between the When Should I Worry booklet, Alistair, and the child cough resources created by Bristol? So how do they complement each other? So they do complement each other. Um, so as Sanjay says, the When Should I Worry booklet was designed to be used within the consultation as a sort of shared decision making tool. Um, the resource that was developed at the University of Bristol by Christy Cabral and others in the team um, is for use at any time. So this can be given to parents when the children are well, so it could be given out at antenatal groups or at immunisation clinics. It can be given out at, during the consultation as well, but it's for use at any time. And what this does is it focuses on things that parents can do, things that parents as the animation demonstrated, the things that are, are really bothering parents, you know, how can I help my child sleep? How can I help my child's temperature? How can I help my child feel better while they're going through this miserable illness until they've recovered? Uh, and that's what this focuses on. Okay, so- How have you introduced it, Alistair? I mean, I'm really interested in that. We've set up something similar in Wessex called Healthier Together and aligning not just health, but health and social care. And, you, and you, you mentioned antenatal clinics. And how do GPs kind of work with the wider healthcare system and beyond healthcare? We discussed schools with earlier, pharmacies didn't we? And pharmacies. pharmacies. So, so let's massively. discuss pharmacies. So could this, this would be useful in pharmacies. Uh, it it would, could be something that could yeah. be done with CCGs and pharmacies, yeah, couldn't yeah, it? Definitely, and it's on, it's on websites. So it's on the RCGP Target Toolkit website. So it's uh, readily available to download there as well. And I think, um, you know, Sanjay, I think you were just reminding us again that we need a consistent approach across the health service, um, across social care. Mm. The resources that you've developed are really important there. As I recall, forgive, forgive me if I'm wrong, but they're an online resource. Yes. So that's the sort of thing that parents can turn to in the middle of the night when they're concerned, for example, and they, you know, they perhaps don't want to necessarily phone the NHS, although of course they can at any time. Um, so it's about developing things that can support people through a range of different needs and different times of the day and yeah. so on. I think the implementation is is extremely challenging and I think that's the next step of so research. It takes us really on to, there's been quite a few questions with every single webinar about the fact, well, what about patients? Surely we need a mass media campaign to change the public's behaviour. So rather than using all these these tools and things, what do you think? I completely agree. I think that we have to take every opportunity we have to uh, to market these messages. I do think that the recommendation from a trusted healthcare professional is extremely powerful, and I don't think that either of these things should be used in isolation. I think they should be used in tandem. But I think that priming potentially from a mass media campaign, which is then reinforced by a combination of healthcare professionals that starts off with midwives when you're pregnant to health visitors that see you and your child pre and post delivery, to practice nurses that are immunising, to GPs, pharmacists, frontline hospital doctors, makes these messages extremely powerful. And at the moment, we're not doing that because our systems are so fragmented. Okay, and did you mention schools as well? I so didn't mention schools, but I should have mentioned schools. Yeah, I think we, we've been doing a lot of work with schools in Wessex. I know you've been doing a lot with schools, haven't you, Clona, in terms of eBug? Well, yeah, eBug, yes. Yeah, so. and, and I think that it's a real opportunity and one that we have to be addressing because if we can get some of these messages through to children, key stages one and two and then three and four, we have an impact on their future expectations and health seeking behaviour and that of those of their parents. And, and, and also getting them to model some of this stuff. And I know hand washing in schools is really important. Um, coughs and their approaches to, 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 to sneeze and bin it and all of those things. If we can get them to model that stuff at school, we reduce transmission in schools, but also change behaviour. So we could use e-bug in schools and also the Antibiotic Guardian um, campaign, so we can encourage families to be involved with that as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, many of us have signed up and pledged to 
do our bit to support antimicrobial stewardship, and that's one way in which yeah. everyone can uh, join the. Are you uh, an antibiotic guardian, Sanjay? Yes, I am. I do think that this that's combination of having national resources that are locally implemented because locally people need to feel some buy-in if we want them to implement it at a local level. Okay, so I've got one last question before we finish off. I know we're keen to finish off, but this is just one last question from one of our participants. And it comes back, we're going to finish back on the bacteria and viruses, really. Because this person has said, what proportion of those children admitted had bacterial versus viral infections? And, and so was that looked at at all? So I think, I'm presuming that this is a star wave question. Yes, is that a right? star okay. wave question. So um, you will find the full details to the answer to that question on the website. It's one of the resources. Um, but we did look at that uh, and we, we looked at the discharge diagnoses and from those we estimated that only a quarter could have been bacterial and could therefore have been modified by an antibiotic. So even amongst those children that are being admitted in a large cohort like Starwave, most of them are probably viral. So that's interesting in itself. So that's quite a good thing um, to finish with, to reassurance that um, we're not going to be uh, missing lots of children who should be admitted. Yeah. Okay, so, well, that's the end of this sixth webinar, and many thanks for participating. I do hope that sharing experiences of how to understand patient expectations and address them will help you in your daily practice. Don't forget to explore all the materials associated with this webinar. You can replay the video and you'll also find files and links to the studies discussed in the webinar on the website. You'll soon be receiving an email asking you to reflect on how you may take forward actions suggested in the webinar and giving us some feedback. Please do complete this if possible, as it will help us all to improve and give you CPD. So see you next week for webinar seven, the last in our series, when our topic will be a common practice approach with Professor Pete Smith and Elizabeth Beach. We'll be revisiting how you can put many of the things we've discussed in the previous webinars into practice. So do send us any questions in advance. Until then, goodbye.